Thanks, Hugh, for uh, inviting me to, to share this discussion with, with Kevin, with you and the school and the students. Um, it's 30 years since Kevin and I first met. It was 30 years ago that Kevin became the fourth ever winner of the Pritzker Prize uh, for Architecture. He followed Louis Barragan, Philip Johnson and Jim Sterling. Um, and when he won the prize, um, the AI, through Tony Reddy, who had worked in Kevin's office, and I wrote to Kevin to say we'd like to put on an exhibition of his work if we could. And um, he facilitated us to mount a full retrospective exhibition, which toured the country, but had its principal opening in the, Dos in the Douglas Hyde Gallery in Trinity College, opened by the Taoiseach at the time, Charlie Hawhey. Um, and Kevin also gave a lecture that year to the RAI conference in Killarney, um, ably supported by his wife Jane in the presentation, which was a masterclass in how to uh, show um, what an architect does. Uh, the lecture was in two parts and lasted five hours. <laughs> and the hall was full to the end. So by comparison, this is going to be a quick scamper. Um, just to set the scene, Kevin was born in Dublin in 1922 um, to a political family. Um, his father was a Sinn Féin TD, elected to the first doll. Um, but in Kevin's youth, early years, the family moved to Mitchellstown, where Kevin's father uh, managed the co-op and turned it into Europe's largest creamery. So I'd like to start, Kevin, by asking you, for a background like that, why did you decide to study architecture? That is an impossible question to answer. <laughs> Because nobody, an architect, who wants to be an architect? You know, nobody ever heard of me when I was there. And indeed, I didn't, I went to Rockwell. I was kind of interested in, in for some reason. We had a big loft in our backyard, and I was always building things in it, and for some reason or other. And uh, when I went to Rockwell, I discovered the seven lamps of architecture in the library, which was the other thing. Ruskin's book. And we had, a, we had a half an hour private time in the study at night. And so I used to do a little drawing. And I was doing a drawing one night of a church, because of course that's all we did all the time. We prayed and <laughs> went to church all the time. So I was think, trying to think of what building would you design. So I designed a church. And I had in this incredible epiphany, I designed the church in the shape of a cross in the plan. And I got so excited. I couldn't believe it, you know, but I believe it was some of this, this enlightenment and all that. And when I was going to the dormitory that night, I told my best friend, he said, you stupid. He said, don't you know every church is in the shape of a cross? <laughs> <laughs> it hadn't occurred to me. That <laughs> <laughs> came that way. But one thing led to another, and uh, I, I was a terrible student. I failed everything. In every class I was ever. When I was in the Christian, local Christian Brothers. I went to get my, I was sick for a while, and I went to get my year report, this one was about 12 or so. And the Christian Brother came out and he gave me this thing, and I looked at the list as I was walking over, and they had the honor students, and I wasn't on that. And then there were the past students, and I wasn't on that. And then there were the failed students, and I wasn't on that. <laughs> and then there was the local sort of village idiot. This was a poor guy who was about 20 years old and walked around pulling a little wooden toy train behind everywhere. And so that was Patsy Moon. And then there was Kevin Roach. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even qualify to fail. Uh, but you, but you made it to UCD. I made it to UCD. And what, 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 what was the school like then? What was, well, what was the teaching like? My father drove me up to Dublin and we went into Earl's Terrace and they put a 20 pound note on the, on the little counter and I was signed up for the architecture school. And, the, <laughs> <laughs> and the architecture school then was very small. There were only 11 other students in the year I joined it. And it was in a, an old building that had been built for one of the Queen's visits to Dublin in the 19th century, I guess. And there were cat, plaster casts of various monuments around the world, but the center of the whole thing was filled with sand because they were filling sandbags for because this was the war was just beginning and all that. And so we had sand grid everywhere, you know, you 
drawing and there's been little, little layers of sand on your drawing as you're going through. And it was uh, Rudolf Maximilian Butler was the professor. Uh, I told the story earlier, but when we went in, we were brought down to his office, which was in the basement, and we were all waiting for the message. You know, the professor was going to the message. And he said, there are no plums in architecture. That was the end of the message. <laughs> <laughs> so that wasn't a very good send-off. But we spent our first year learning all the details of, of Greek revival architecture, because that's really what he was interested in. And I he, he, was, he was the designer of Earlsford Terrace, he, wasn't he? he? Where Earlsford the school Terrace. was. And it was, um, we were, Carson was totally isolated during the war, and we had no books in the library. Nobody had ever heard of Le Bouget or anybody like that. You know, it just, there was no communication. And uh, we, in the second year, things began to change a little bit, and in the third year, uh, we were finally beginning to realize there was something called modern architecture. And the only reason we knew a little bit about it because a couple of the students had uh, been in France before the war, and so they knew. But there was absolutely nothing in the library. There was nothing you could love, you couldn't look up anything up. And so it was all kind of invention. Gradually, so we began to realize what was going on. And by the time we graduated, we had some peripheral and very vague knowledge of modern movement, which wasn't that old at that point in time, maybe 20 years or so. And uh, we all graduated pretty innocent, I think, of what was going on. In the but rest of the you, world. you were you were a pretty talented group. I mean, in, in the year before you, there was Pat Scott. In your year, there was Robin Walker. And then there was a maverick, Dan O'Herlihy. And Dan O'Herlihy was, was in his father, his son is Lurkin O'Herlihy, is a, yeah. a well-known architect in Los oh, Angeles yes, now. Yes, I know, yes. And uh, Danny was also, had little bit parts in the Abbey while he was at school. And did I did I did I understand he, he, he entertained the the class and you did his work for him? <laughs> is, that, is that a bit? <laughs> I, that may be part of the lore, but I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kevin Fox was there, Wilfred Cantwell, and several other very uh, Ken Kirsten, very talented people who all happened to be in the school. Um, and some of them had they sort of fled Europe. Some of them fled England, so it was quite a mixture of people, even though they were very small, a small group. And while you say that there wasn't, certainly in your early years, much knowledge of, of international work, your own thesis was for a president's residence, yes. which I think today we call the Taoiseach's house. Right. It was the president of the executive who would be the Taoiseach right. then. Right. But it shows uh, influences from Le Corbusier and from the Pavillon Suisse. Well, there was, yes. How, how I, did you know about I this? I discovered the, the Corbu school in, where is it, in Switzerland? But in, par in Paris? No, <coughs> the third entrance. Yeah, was in Paris. Yeah. So stole, it, but it's the Pavillon stole, Suisse. Yeah, the Swiss I Pavillon. stole that and used it. And then after, after graduating, you worked briefly with Michael Scott. You worked on the, on the three CIE buildings, yeah? Yes, I, I got a job as a lecturer, in, I, and I just remember this, lecturer in UCD. I was teaching in Bolton Street. The lecturer was two pounds a week, and Bolton Street was two pounds a week, and Michael Scott was two pounds a week. So I was actually earning six pounds a week. <laughs> <laughs> but I was working about 12 hours a day. And uh, Michael was wonderful. He really was a fine architect. And he had a lot of young architects in the office. And we all kind of stimulated each other, you know. Kevin Fox and yes, Wolf Cantwell exactly. and these people. Yeah. And there was a Dan Danish guy who kind of ran the whole thing. Yeah. And then Michael, I wanted to get the hell out. So Michael introduced me to Maxwell Fry. And I went to London for a while. And in London, 
I was leafing through a um, architecture magazine and I read something about Mies van der Rohe and I decided that's what I wanted to do was to go and study with him. So a year after that I applied to IIT and Tower and Yale and for some incredible reason I got accepted. But also Fred Hilton and I, we didn't mention Fred, mm -hmm. went to, to Chicago to study with these. And that was quite an experience, it was really wonderful. He was a very large, slightly grumpy man, but very pleasant. And uh, he didn't say anything at all, he practically said nothing in the whole time. But he was quite an influence, and we were uh, asked to design a house for ourselves. And of course, every house had to have a flat roof, because that was all part of it. But I decided, perversely, that I'd put a pitch roof because it was snowing like hell <laughs> in Chicago. And you know, I was wondering, what the hell are you going to do with all that snow on top of the flat roof? So I put a pitch roof on it. And Mies came to my desk, and he looked at my drawing and my pitch roof and that. And he said, you could do that, but I would not do that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was the final dismissal. Because <laughs> you didn't stay long. You didn't stay as long no, as you no. had intended. Well, I figured I'd got the message, you know. How long <laughs> <laughs> so after that, it was, it was New York, and you were working on the so, UN headquarters building. So I got a bus and went back to New York, and I had very little money, and I got a job at the United Nations. I wanted to work. The United Nations of Under Construction had just been formed. I really wanted to make a country. This is very ambitious, and I, got, I wanted to make a contribution to world peace. <laughs> and I thought if I were kind of young, that would be something. So I got a job and, uh, at the UN as an office boy. They didn't have me as an architect. But after about four or five months, they finally put me on the drafting table. And they was this with Wally Harrison? or Wally Harrison, Harrison and Ron Whitson. It's on the site. Of the, the office was on the side of the final building. So I actually saw the building going under construction. And then you'd build two major landmarks within sight of it yourself later in your career, but... Well, I didn't know I was going to do, do that. that. <laughs> so, Aero er, er, Saren, and how did, how did that come about? I mean, well, why, why would you be attracted? If you were initially attracted to Mies yeah. and that discipline and that rigour, why would you well, go to someone work like Aero? I was in New York for about six months, and I totally broke. I was on the bump. And I had a friend who happened to know Aero and, and knew that Aero was looking for people. And uh, I had a cousin called Captain Ryan who was briefly a movie star of sorts, and she had got a job with MGM, and she had come to New York, uh, and she had, she had an MGM expense account, so we went out drinking for about a week, and we were on the, <laughs> El Morocco and the, all the various clubs around New York. And this girl that I knew set up a date for Arrow to interview me. He was in the Plaza Hotel. And I'd been up all night and I went to, uh, up to his room. He was getting dressed for the interview. And I sat on the edge of the bed and Arrow had a very slow delivery. And I finally fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> And I didn't really want to go with her because I'd seen his father's work in Ed Cranbrook and I didn't particularly like him. Either. But he hired me for some reason, which I'll never understand. But he did hire me and I got uh, my last few dollars. I got a train out to Birmingham, Michigan, where his office was, out to actually Detroit. And then uh, got a bus up to Birmingham, Michigan. And started work without having been to bed at all. And that night somebody led me to a boarding house. There was a Mrs. Looney on Purdy Street. And she had a room for a dollar a night. And so that's where I've been there for about six or seven years. 
<laughs> now, when, when you went, Aero had just won the commission for General, General Motors, Motors, for GM sorry. Tech, which was <laughs> the biggest project in the world in the 1950s. It was, it was $100 million at that point. In, in the 1950s. And you, he had an office. You were about, what, 10 people when you came in? It yes, and it got to be 105 or so. Yeah, Actually, and other yes. people who were there in your time were yes. Cesar Pelli, oh, he came later, later yeah. Robert Venturi. They all came later. They all came later. Yeah. So you were in on the ground so floor. I was in on the ground floor. So what, what was your job with, 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 with Aero? Because, I mean, you were well, chief design assistant, I think, within a few well, years. After a while, but uh, the first job I had was to do a rendering from Brandeis University, and I couldn't do a rendering, so I scribbled all over the drawing. And Aero didn't see it, and he got on the train and went to Brandeis to make the presentation. He discovered this thing I had done. And when he came back, he said, fire that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I was fired, but he took me back again. <laughs> and so then we got to know each other, and we had a very, we a very good relationship. I, um, I uh, did a lot of the detailing at General Motors. And, he was very good. He meant he, he let And you how did it work? I mean, did, did Aero make sketches and pass them down the he office? Did, or, he or? did, and then we could come back with alternatives, and he would come back. That was a, a good relationship. He was absolutely wonderful. He was a brilliant, brilliant architect. And he was a very strong sculptor, and he could draw beautifully with everything. But you, you have said somewhere that uh, you, you spent almost 24 hours a day with oh, yes. Aero. It wasn't like a normal no, relationship. Can you talk a bit about and, that? And Aero would come in at 10 o'clock in the morning, and he liked to work till midnight. And he worked every day, and I remember one day uh, he was complaining because there weren't enough people in the office. And I said, well, you know, it's New Year's Day. And he had no idea. He was absolutely focused and tremendously as if he knew he'd only have 11 years to, to live to do it all. Yeah. But you say while he was focused, I mean, he could lose the big picture a bit, yeah? I mean, you, you, you used an expression Some, once to me about if you put air on a field or something. Oh, yeah. I always thought if you put it in the field to plow the field, he'd dig a hole. Because <laughs> <laughs> he had that sort of intense and focus. Your job, your job was to so keep... I, I tried to keep the old plow going. <laughs> <laughs> and I would keep, you know bringing focused in on various projects because there were a lot of things going on. But then, I mean, working in Detroit must have been extraordinary. I mean, it's, it's where the slogan was, where today meets tomorrow, where the ideas of the arsenal of democracy were kind of being worked so, out. And Cranbrook had a big influence on the art field in Detroit. Then Charles Eames, Charles and Reams, and Bill Cranbrook, and, they, and there were a lot of um, similar George Nelson and that who had been there. So it was a very lively, from a design point of view, it was a very, very lively place to be. And the interesting thing, there was no catalogue of parts. In other words, if you wanted a door handle, you had to design the door handle. You, anything, you couldn't just go to the catalogue and buy it. You, know, you had to actually design everything, every detail. And that was kind of a great experience. You know. But the only thing you get from a catalog was toilet pictures. <laughs> yeah, the rest of it but but then your your client was the automobile industry, the automobile industry. and you learnt a lot from that and brought several innovations into architecture for the first time in well, in your practice through, true, through GM Tech. I mean, true. neoprene gaskets never existed in architecture no, before. John, John Dinklu was very very technology, technologically focused, and the, the idea of glazing. You know, the the cars were glazed with neoprene. And so he decided, why couldn't you glaze a building in that same way? And so that was really the first time that was ever used. The five-foot module was developed. You may think that things in travel not that you have to develop something like a module, but it's true. And uh, in, in the idea of high-rise office buildings laid out with, on the basis of a five-foot module throughout the whole building, you can move it. The movable partition was developed, and all these things, the metal partition. Before that, it was just all sheetrock. So a lot of things, a lot of things were developed then. And, and, and you also, you also did uh, full-scale mock-ups, which I think hadn't been done yes, before. Did. And I, I, I think would, there's an amazing photograph of a staircase outside your office, 
I think, which is part of the St. Louis Arch, yes. um, which is like a full scale of, yeah. of part of the... Yes, we did. I, I encouraged the idea of Commodus because that arrow had a sculpture's mind and it was easy for, easier for him to see things when they were rendered in three dimensions. And it was then easier for everybody to understand who should be modeling. Everybody could focus on it. People fumbling through working drawings. You know, with architects don't seem to realize that the rest of the world doesn't, can't read drawings. <laughs> and, and you know, they, they draw quarter, quarter uh, circles all over the place, which is door swings. And somebody's looking at their house and they see all these quarter circles. They have no idea what is it. You know, they have no idea what that is. So we managed with the model to be able to communicate. And then with John and his interest in technology, I mean, there are a couple of other innovations I just want to, to mention. I mean, Cortan steel used in architecture for the first time. I was, uh, I was, uh, we were drinking with Kevin Fox one night, and uh, I got this idea, of why the hell wouldn't you build buildings that would just rust and fall down after a few years, <laughs> so there'd be more buildings to do. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I was kidding with John, I told him that, and he got the idea of, you know, you could use a rusted steel. And he went to, down to Pittsburgh to play steel. And as it turned out, they had just developed the core thing, which they were developing for high-rise uh, wire uh, structures for holding for up transmissions. Yeah. So he, John got into it. He got them interested. And they ran, uh, went to uh, Pittsburgh Steel, and they ran the things as I-beams and WFs and all of that stuff. So he really started the whole business in, you know, Cartan. And at IBM, reflective glazing? And the reflective glazing was something, and I hate to say this, but I proposed that too. And that was the idea of the mirror. And why couldn't you do? We were going to do a building for Allison Jet. It never happened. And we showed it as reflect. But then gradually, John Galinch didn't develop the glass to be you know, energy efficient and all of that. So it was all of those things. And then you were going to move in 1960-61 to Connecticut, to beside Yale, and in the middle of the move, Aero suddenly died at the age of 51. Yes. Uh, and you were, what, 40? I was in... 19, 39? In 19, what you were? Yeah, in 1961, you are 39. 39, yes. 39, and you were a famous architect uh, but you weren't a registered architect. No, I wasn't even a citizen. <laughs> so, and I was going to get married to Jane, but it, as it turned out, the week Arrow died, so we had to postpone it for a couple of years. And uh, that was difficult. So that was an enormous responsibility because there were, what, nine or ten major projects on the boards or on site, and you had to finish but, them. But you know, the nature of the office was we just settled down and did it. I was at a meeting in New York with CBS, and we were talking about the number of elevators and all of that stuff, and I got a call, and I went into another room, and the caller said that Errol had just died. And I decided what Errol would do is he'd come back into the meeting. So I went back in the meeting, we finished the meeting, and then I told him, well, you know, and... It was that, that was the nature, we just went for it. And those buildings that you had to finish out included the TWA Terminal, Dulles Airport, yeah. St. Louis Arch, yeah. CBS in New York, yeah. and a whole bunch of others, which you finished within five years. Yes. Meanwhile, trying to set up your own practice. Yeah, how, right. did you, how did you, you weren't a partner in the firm when no, Aero died, no. John was. John and I were very close, so we had, had broken up at one point in time. We were gonna start our own firm. And Errol found out about it and almost fired both of us. <laughs> <laughs> but then you had to do that at the same time as finishing Errol's buildings. At and the same time. Errol had been on the list for interview for Oakland Museum. For Oakland, and uh, we decided that we would have, you know, find and went to them. <coughs> and I had this idea. Looking at a site, a map of um, Oakland, there's Lake Merritt. And then Oakland was built on one side of that, and then it looked out to the bay. The connection between the lake and the bay was an area where the new building was going to be. But I decided it shouldn't be a building because you'd be blocking this seemingly natural <coughs> connection between the two. 
and what it really needed was to be a landscape uh, place. And so we managed to convince the mayor of uh, Oakland at that time was Irish crazy guy called Hulan, Hulan, and of course he attached to me a little bit. Suddenly so helped. And, uh, well, I think, I think to, to say that that was the reason maybe is, is to underplay something else that, that's very important in, in Oakland um, because the, you, made, you made these amazing gouache drawings of the plans for Oakland. Yeah. I mean, like diagrams rather than architectural plans. Yeah. And then you photographed them on slide film and yes. you made the first ever slide presentation, as I understand, or you're credited with inventing yeah. the slide presentation in architecture, which is like PowerPoint 40 years before yeah. PowerPoint was I conceived mean, of. You start, again, I, it was that whole thing of people just don't understand what they were talking about when you're waving your arms and pointing to line drawings. <coughs> so you have to start at the beginning, explain what it is now, explain what you're thinking has been, you know, what the various alternatives are, and you show what the various alternatives are. And then you gradually narrow it down until you reach the point where it seems that this is inevitable. It has to be your design. This is the only thing that could possibly happen. <laughs> but that's where you want to end up. You know, that you, you just can't wave your hands. And, and can, can I talk just about that a little bit, about persuading clients and handling of information and that sort of... Um, your research-based methods of design, which come out of systems analysis, which started in the military. And I know that Aero, during the Second World War, was in the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which was right. the forerunner of the CIA, and that he was head of the Visual Communications Department mm -hmm. of OSS, and that he designed the White House War Room. And how much, I mean, were, were you guys, even in, in the 50s, were you in on this way of thinking before anybody else? I, I can say, but I, I think we may have we may have been very well. We may have been. I, I didn't know anybody else that was doing it, it the, because the traditional uh, way is you get a job and you come back with a design, and the owner says, "Okay, let's go," and that was it. Nowadays, you don't get the job. You keep looking around for the job, and the job finally. Then they say, would you mind doing a number of schemes? They don't say for free, but that's what they mean. <laughs> and then, so then they have 10 architects, each designing four or five schemes for something. And then they put together a commission of people, they look and they decided to do this. And then, so then you get hired. And then you start to design and they say, well, now we're not going to pay you until we have an approved design. In other words, by this time you're out of profit by more money than you have. And so finally you get the design and they say, okay, that looks pretty good. And then you go to city planning, then you go to the community board, then you go to all the oddballs who are saying, this, you can't build there, you can't build there, you can't do anything. And finally, finally, finally it all gets resolved. But it's been twisted a little bit. And so then you try to get twisted back into shape again, and then you get going, and then you go through the whole process of doing the documents, and the contractors and subcontractors and the bidding, and then you get into the construction, and the contractor to this, and then the thing starts to leak, and then something blows <laughs> off, and then something else falls down, but and then the door swings don't work. <laughs> But, but the, the presentation certainly worked. And two other projects that were kind of fundamental around, around that time were Ford Foundation. Um, I, I'm wondering how you came up with the concept of an office building with a garden embedded in it. And was it, a, were, you, were you making a deliberate strike back against the Seagram building, which had established no. the plaza and you were re-establishing the street line? No, no, no. I didn't. I never liked the idea. That there was a thing that happened in zoning in New York where that if you created an open plaza, then you could add more space to the building that you were building. And Sigrams, of course, did that, but they didn't add the additional space, and they created this big plaza. But plazas are big empty spaces. Nobody fills them in the plazas in New York. 
And Errol did <coughs> not do that at CBS. He put the building in the center of the plaza, and we got, got into a big argument about that. But uh, what I was interested in at the, uh, was the, the, the need in the human mind to connect with nature. And the, I have the greatest sympathy in the world for people who work in office buildings. That would be the most boring, boring, boring world. And it's even more boring now because all you're doing is staring at the stupid computer all day long. And, you know, communicating back, telling dirty jokes back and forth or whatever. <laughs> and, and the amount of work that gets done is minimal and it's all coded and everything else like that. Boring, 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 boring. So how do you, what do you do for the people who are working in offices that gives them a little bit of relief, a little bit, how do you create a sense of community? How do you give them some connection back to nature? How do you make their lives just a little bit better than it is in the typical life? Those people who work in high rises are condemned to hell. It's a hell up in the air, you know. Just, who wants to live like that? You got a few years to live. You want to sit in a stupid desk all day long and, you know, complain about what they're paying you, complaining about things too close to us, you know. You want to create something which people really feel a little bit better, contribute a little bit to their nature and what they want. And it's without getting confrontational or anything and things like that. I think our role is to try and improve the lot of the citizen in whatever way you can do it. And one of the ways you can do it is bring in a few trees and a few fountains and a little bit of relaxation and some relief from the pressure of work and your boss on your back and all that stuff. You've been very good to Yale University, your neighbor. Um, when you won the Pritzker Prize, you don donated the prize money to establish a chair of architecture in Eero's name. Yes. You donated Eero's archives and later your own archives uh, to Yale. But you've never taught, as far as I know. Why did you not teach after Dublin? Well, I never had any time to do that. <laughs> it good. takes time to do it. It takes time. Um, um, and I hope you don't mind me asking, but how do you feel about uh, being a member of what uh, Izzy Metstein uh, called um, the Rubble Club? Architects who've had their buildings demolished in their own lifetime. And I'm thinking in particular of, of the New Haven Coliseum. Yes. Um, what, how, how did you feel when that was demolished in the last few well. years? I wish they demolished it instead they blew it up, which is even worse. <laughs> <laughs> but that was an interesting political situation. The mayor of New Haven, who was also Irish origin, he didn't hurt, uh, got him very ambitious to create a new New Haven and to bring a center of conventions and all of that sort of thing. You met him on a plane? I met him on a plane and we had established good relationships. I did several buildings for them. And uh, he start, started this idea of the convention center and then we did that, we developed it. And then he retired and the, before the building was finished. And the building was something like, uh, it was projected to be 10 million, or perhaps 11 million. The dollars and it came in at 12 million dollars. And uh, the, the succeeding mayor didn't like uh, Mayor Lee, and the board didn't like him because they felt he was too aggressive, he'd done too much noise. So they really, there was no support for it. And they, after a while, they just dropped the whole thing. So it, it was, they, they didn't create the management for it. They didn't, so it was, it was in trouble from early on? It was from right from the beginning, it was in trouble, it never really. They had... Uh, to find out about it, uh, you should check out the issue of Perspecta called Monster, um, published about, what, two, three years ago, which has um, a, a lot about the, the, the Colosseum, including photographs of, of its destruction, and a, an interview with, with, with Kevin. 
but I'm under pressure, Kevin, to wrap this up. We, we have barely touched us. As I said, 45 minutes was going to be a bit of a scamper through I this. I I'm talking too much. <laughs> um, but I, I want to kind of end, really, by, by um, uh, echoing what Bob Stern said recently about you uh, in Washington at the Building Center when he said that you carved out your own territory in modern architecture, in the third generation of modern architecture. And the areas to which you made unique and original contributions, which are shared by all architects today have to do in the field of building typologies. We've got Oakland and we've got Ford Foundation. Um, the Federal Bank in New York, which wasn't built, was a skyscraper on stilts with a plaza below it. Um, New Haven Coliseum was a sports stadium with a car park over it. Um, you developed the Grand Scraper, really, at Union Carbide, and I wish we could have talked more about that, which pre-heralded uh, developments in Silicon Valley. There's technology and all the new materials that you brought into architecture. There's your design methodology, which involved interviewing hundreds of, of workers, for example, at Union Carbide before the design process began. Uh, there's your concern for the environment, um, both in real terms and in symbolic terms uh, from the very beginning of your independent career and presentation techniques. And on top of it all, you are the only architect that I know uh, who has been able to complete his master's work um, to the satisfaction of the entire uh, architectural community and world, and then carve out an equally brilliant individual career. You're an honor to the School of Architecture and to UCD, Kevin. Um, and I'd like to finish just, you said that at the start, you'll have a word then before we finish. Um, <laughs> you said at the start that you went to the UN out of a sense of idealism that you wanted to do something for world peace. And I noticed that the last line, I remember the last line of your Pritzker Prize um, acceptance address in 1982 was, and this is coming after the Cold War and all of that, uh, to say, um, to build well is an act of peace. So before we, everyone, uh, thanks you, Kevin. You want to have the last I, word as usual. I just have one quick story. When I was in my third year at UCD, we were asked to design a house, and I designed a house which had a, in the shape of a cross. And in the center, <laughs> uh, I, I put a spiral stairs, and I really got focused. I'd never seen a spiral stairs like that, and it was all suspended wires and things like that. And I, worked it out very carefully and all that, and I was so proud of it. And Maddie McDermott, who was the... You taught me too in the 1970s. Yeah. Came along, and I was sure he was going to love it. And he looked at her, and then he said, sure, sure, sure you'd never get a coffin down those stairs. I thought, you know, this is not really stuff. But then it dawned, of course, we got to get coffins out of everywhere because that's <laughs> what our future is. <laughs> and so Not too soon. it led me to this philosophical chant which says, you know, we're here for a purpose. In architecture, your purpose is to make a contribution to the well-being of the community, however you do it. But don't ever forget that that is why you are architects, that is why you are here. It's not to be starch in Texas, not to make all, twist everything into a world. You can do that too, but you have to make a contribution to, to the well-being of the community because otherwise you have left nothing behind. And we'll just take your coffin and push it out of the window. <laughs>